we got to, to Nyson right before the Rhine, and we couldn't. We, we we did take that village, but during after we took it, we we decided we would we would uh, take our destroyers in the backyard, and uh, in case there was a counterattack, we'd be ready for them. Well, we pulled the uh, destroyer in the backyard, and we, I couldn't traverse my gun because of trees and limbs that were in the way. Well, my, my driver, which was a Native American Indian, uh, his name was Haskey, and he jumped out on his own and it was cutting those down for me so I could do that. And we got a terrific barrage of mortar shells and one shell hit six feet in front of him, and of course it exploded, and a piece of shrapnel went through his steel helmet and come out the back. Well, you know what happened to him. Of course, my commander and I went out immediately, jumped out, and had tried to help him, but we couldn't. You are about to embark upon the Great Crusade to meet this mounting aggression. And make no mistake about it, good will prevail. I was one of 13 in, uh, children in the family, six girls, excuse me, seven girls and six boys, and uh, uh, in the Great Depression. So it, it wasn't easy for my parents, but they were the best parents I could have, and that's so important. They, uh, they, he, he uh, my father worked at a brickyard nearby and he didn't have a car and he walked to work and he raised a couple of hogs every year and butchered them every fall and we had plenty to eat and uh, even in the depression years and uh, uh, we had a great garden and my wife my mother was a wonderful canning lady and she had uh, great food all the time i never went hungry and uh, I was uh, very impressed with, uh, with the way they trained us. They, they took me to my church when I was one year old and put me on what I called, what they called the cradle roll. And I have a picture of it. And, and uh, one year old, they introduced me to, grew up with uh, uh, being a believer in the Christian faith and I feel like that spirit of God was with me my whole life. And here I am in a hundred. So I uh, was going, and then I got through the second year of high school, and I saw where President Roosevelt created the Civil Conservation Corps, CCC camp. And I, I got all the information about that, and I thought, well, I, maybe I should join that and help my parents. Uh, uh, you know, with money needed to raise that family. So uh, it was $30 a month and I could give them $25 and I kept five and that's what I did. I dropped out of high school and went, and went in there and uh, I tell you, it was, it was a good thing for me to do because it was a lot like the Army. We had barracks and we had, uh, we had a uh, uh, man that uh, would get us out in, in, in the morning like a, so, like a, you know, just like the soldiers do. And we had uniforms and we, had, and we had, it was a camp down near, near Washington and, uh, in a park. And we built uh, picnics, pavilions and fireplaces and roads. And I'll tell you, it was a great training for me for about 18 months. And, uh, and, and uh, after that, I uh, came home and uh, got a job as, as soon as I could. I met a nice girl in Williamsport. We had a uh, uh, some kind of a parade or something in Williamsport, and she was over there with a friend of hers that I went to school with. And I met them, and I fell in love with that girl <laughs> just to meet, and she was beautiful. And uh, we started to date and go together, and we would go out and dance and sing, and you could go to the movies for 15 cents back in, and I mean, it was, you know, so 
I was very happy with her, and then I, uh, I was. I was drafted uh, along with uh, 40 other men from Washington County, and uh, we went to, over to Summit Avenue in Hagerstown and got on a train and was taken down to Fort Meade uh, with about, I would say with about 40 or 50 men. And uh, we uh, went down there to be examined, <clears throat> to get uniforms and shipped to where we were going to serve in the war. I, along with one other man out of that whole group, went to Fort Hood, Texas, which was a great place to be trained. And I'm telling you, they trained us vigorously in all the uh, weapons that we would possibly use and 20-mile uh, hikes. And uh, it, it was just a wonderful training. And uh, with the shooting and artillery and many different weapons and uh, it was just great to be trained in every way that we needed <clears throat> with many different weapons that we might have to use. <clears throat> and that was important too because during the war I changed from a 75 millimeter to a 90. <clears throat> uh, I explained that a while ago. So it was nice to know how to, to step over in that other uh, weapon a vehicle and able to uh, do your job. So uh, that's how we got into the war. And then I, I was, after uh, going through the training there, we went to Camp Campbell, Kentucky, and, uh, and then we went on maneuvers in Tennessee with M10s. That was another tank like uh, destroyer <clears throat> with an open top turret <clears throat> rather than a hatch. Very, it's, it's much easier to select out your target and everything, but it was also dangerous too, because shrapnel could come in there if the shells hit above you. So uh, I had a piece of shrapnel come in the tank and hit my helmet, but it was well spent, so it didn't, it didn't injure me. So I still have that piece of shrapnel that hit my <laughs> helmet, steel helmet. So anyway, uh, we uh, went, we, after the maneuvers, we went to New York City to be shipped overseas. And we got on an English ship called the Scythia. And I was able to get out on the stern of that ship and wave goodbye to America. The next the short days after that, we, we get on, formed a long column of ships. And uh, oh, as far as you could see to the horizon, there were ships. Yeah, but we were guarded on both sides by uh, destroyers with uh, with uh, depth charges that, that they could use if they had to, and they used them once in a while to keep the subs away from the German subs from sinking us. So we got over there safe, and every ship went to their zone that they were traveling to. And uh, ours was, uh, we went to England and then we went to France. Uh, and we couldn't, we wanted to go into a uh, uh, place there right after the invasion. But we couldn't get, the ship couldn't get in there because of sunken ships. So we had to go down over the ship on a rope ladder to get into a smaller, uh, a smaller ship to go in to get our uh, fighting equipment, which we did. And uh, we were ordered to go to Holland to fight in the Market Garden battle. And we got our equipment and went up there. And our equipment was a half track with a tune mount of 75 millimeter on the back of it. But we, we were trained to fight with that, and uh, we were able to do it. And we got through the Market Garden War up there, and uh, uh, we were able to free Holland. And uh, 104th Infantry Division was our partner 
through a lot of the battles, and most of them the battles that we were in, uh, at least uh, half of the war. So and they, we were glad to have them uh, along, fighting along with us. And then, of course, the dive bombers softened them up too before we were in the battle. So that was, that was good too. But it was still war, you know, and uh, we lost men, and it was hard for me to forget that. And uh, it was such a time in the war that we would ask the Germans to give up, and we'd draw pamphlets out of, out of the airplane. And uh, I was looking, standing in the yard there one day, and here comes this German down the road with this waving this, pan, uh, this piece of paper, and I told him, come on in. So he came in, and, and as soon as he got in there, he jumped down into our gun position, and my gun commander knocked him down and put a knife right at his throat, and he started to cuss him out. And I said, come on, Sam, get off of him. I said, he wants to surrender. What are you doing? We dropped these pamphlets for him to surrender, and then now you want to kill him. So. We got him off there and we turned the prisoner in like we should have, <laughs> you know, uh, what we should do, and that's what we did. So, but you know, he was angry and cold, and we do think sometimes we shouldn't do. It, so, then uh, <clears throat> we uh, we came down and uh, joined. We had to break through this uh, into Germany through the through the uh, German line, and we had the pillboxes. We had to knock the pillboxes out to get through that. That wasn't easy. And then we uh, started up through Germany, and uh, General Patton pulled us over uh, to help him stop the tank thrust in the Battle of the Bulge. And that was quite a challenge, too, but we went over and helped him to the till the battle was over and we stopped the tanks. And well, the main thing we did was keep them from re-gassing re up. We just found the gas where they were gassing up and we, we uh, took them out of business and they couldn't do that. So they were sitting ducks after that. <laughs> so we helped him do that even in that cold battle and stuff, a terrible battle. But, and after that we went, uh, uh, up to uh, through Germany to the to the Ruhr River, and we couldn't cross because the bridges were bombed out, and uh, we had to fire artillery protecting the engineers while they built the pontoon bridge so we could cross. Well, here it is December, so here it was Christmas Day, and we got a command to stop firing. So. We, we, of course, take commands, and uh, and they stopped, too. So we were looking over cards that we got from home and enjoying the quietness and, and stopping the fighting for a, a, a while. And here the Germans across the river started to play Christmas carols. And, uh, well, they kept playing them, and we kept, they kept playing the songs that we knew, and we sang with them. <laughs> of course, individually and privately, but it was, it was a special deal for me to think about uh, singing Christmas carols with the enemy, you know. And that's the problem with, you know, with Hitler. He thought everyone had to live like him, and no one else in the world mounted to anything, and that's the wrong way to live, you know? So my Christian way of life is to love everyone. And uh, I didn't hate the Germans. I felt sorry for them because they had to do what he, what he said, regardless of how they felt, you know? So we, uh, we was there firing our guns, our artillery, and it finally got to, but well, an important thing happened there. We went from the Toad Mount, the uh, half track, the Toad 75, we went from that to uh, M36 with a 90 millimeter on it, 
And I'm the gunner, and I really loved that because it was a powerful weapon, <clears throat> and we could get our job done much easier and more effective than with the 75. Well, I, I, I sat on the right, uh, facing from the rear to the front, I, I sat at the, the right hand of the gun, and I had a, uh, I, I, I got my target and I fired it, pulled the trigger, and then I had an assistant gunner, and he, uh, he loaded the gun for me, so I had nothing to do but, well, I mean, I, the commander selected the targets a lot of times too, you know, and told me where the target went, what they wanted to knock out, and I was able to, to sign it up on the, with the uh, with the crosshairs on it and knock it out. If try to knock it out anyway. <laughs> now, now a tiger tank is very tough to knock out because it weighed 72 tons. And I didn't know this, but I I realized that when we took a, a lot of trips to celebrate the war, I found out a lot of things about it, how much it weighed, how thick the armor was, it was slanted, and no wonder we couldn't knock it out. But what, what we did, we knocked the tracks off of it and paralyzed it, and then we could go around to the back and knock it out from the rear. But they had a swivel 88 on there, too, so you had to be careful or you'd get knocked out too before you got to knock them out. So, But we we were well trained in the United States to fight uh, the war. We got to, to Nison right before the Rhine and we couldn't, we, we, we did take that village, but during, after we took it, we, we decided we would we would uh, take our destroyers in the backyard of the of the uh, town, and uh, in case there was a counterattack, we'd be ready for them. Well, we I pulled we pulled the uh, destroyer in the backyard, and we I couldn't traverse my gun because of trees and limbs that were in the way. Well, my my driver, which was a Native American Indian, uh, his name was Haskey, and he jumped out on his own, and it was cutting those down for me so I could do that. And we got a terrific barrage of mortar shells, and one shell hit six feet in front of him, and of course it exploded, and a piece of shrapnel went through his steel helmet and come out the back. Well, you know what happened to him. Of course, my commander and I went out immediately, jumped out and had tried to help him, but we couldn't save him. So we took him back in the building and that, that he lost his life right there trying to do what he could do for us. And his name was Albert Haskey. So that's sometimes after the war, for a long time, you can start talking about uh, some things like I'm doing now, and and you can do it without breaking down. But for many years, I couldn't talk about it. I think about losing them guys and uh, things. So we uh, crossed the Rhine as soon as possible on the pontoon bridge and. Uh, went up through that area uh, toward, the, toward the Rhine from between the, the uh, Ruhr River and the Rhine. I think we was some toughest fighting, I tell you. We, uh, we were pinned down one day and uh, my, 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 my platoon leader come over, my, uh, Lieutenant Rubino, and he said, Jack, I want you to put a shell in that church window, 500 yards out there, and he said, put an AT shell in there. <clears throat> he said, I think we're, they were they were guiding the the attack on us, and we couldn't, you know, they were shelling us, shelling us, shelling us, and we couldn't move. So I put a shell right in there, an AT shell went right in the window and exploded when it got inside. And from then on, we could, we could move, evidently he was right. So I was just doing my duty. And uh, so then uh, 
we got to the river, to the Rhine River after after we got through there, and we couldn't cross because the bridges were bombed out there too. So then we had we got orders to go to southern France, and drive through southern France. But here we are with these M36 tank-like destroyers, and they said, "Well, take those back and put them on flat cars, railroad cars." and take that long trip on the railroad car down to southern France. And uh, then you can start driving there. And uh, we, uh, that's what we did. And then we we got down to southern Fr uh, France and we, we started the same, uh, pretty much the same war activities as up there, taking hill by hill and machine gun nests by machine gun nests and small vehicles and tanks and we uh, we drove on taking village by village and uh, we got to uh, Dachau. Yeah, Dachau. And uh, we were with the 40, oh down there too, we were with the 42nd Rainbow Division Army. Uh, uh, we got up to the uh, uh, prison camp there, Dachau, to see those men and women in there, I mean, to tell you, I mean nothing. When I say skin and bone, I mean skin and bone. There was no meat on it. So it was horrible. And, and that's what they did, you know, and they, they just starved them and put them in gas chambers and, uh, oh, it was terrible. So I, I just, that was the worst part, and like I said, I think it was near the end of the war, and, and some of the pre, uh, German soldiers just about thought, well, it, you know, it was near the end, and they was a little bit easier to capture than they were before. So it was still tough because, you know, the, as terrible looking as as the camps were to start with, and then you had to capture the German soldier or kill him, one or two, whatever they decided they wanted to do. But uh, that's that's where we ended the war right there, right there. And uh, I thought that I was in a good outfit and very fortunate and to get through it without getting wounded or killed. And, uh, even though I lost a lot of uh, buddies, and, and that was hard to forget, and it took me a, a long while to get over that before I could speak in, uh, you know, to people after the war, which I can do now, but I couldn't for a long time because of feeling sorry for the guys I lost, you know. <laughs>